Speed. Awesome speed. There's nothing quite like it. Nothing so impressive as when man and his weapon become one. What's it take to develop this skill? For you to be fast on the draw and fast from shot to shot? Well, that's what this program is all about. We'll look at some of the fastest shooters in the world, compare their equipment, their techniques and methods, and talk with them one-on-one, -on -one, all in an effort to find out how to shoot fast and accurately. Lenny McGill. Shooting fast is easy. It's when you have to shoot fast and accurately that it becomes a lot more difficult. Now, I believe there are certain things you can do and concentrate on that are going to help you shoot faster. And that's what this program is all about. In putting together this tape, we consulted some of the world's greatest, fastest, and most accomplished shooters, including Rob Latham, four-time IPSC Nationals Champion, two-time IPSC World Champion, NRA Bianchi Cup winner and Speed Event winner, plus winner of countless other regional and local contests. Ryan Enos, winner of the NRA Bianchi Cup, the speed event in the Masters, and a certified combat master. Jerry Barnhart, winner of the Steel Challenge, IPSC Nationals, and the speed event in the Masters competition. Chip McCormick, two-time winner of the Steel Challenge and top five finisher in the USPSA Nationals. J. Michael Plaxco, the only man to ever win the Steel Challenge, the Second Chance, and the USPSA Nationals in the same year, plus he's a renowned combat gunsmith as well. And Ken Tapp, 56-year-old Ken Tapp, two-time winner of the Second Chance and the 1988 Masters Champion. So with the help of these shooters, this videotape, lots of practice, and the use of the sweet spot theory, I guarantee you will become a faster, more accurate shooter. Now let's get started with the first segment of our tape. It's all about equipment. Having all the equipment in the world is not going to make you the next world champion. What it will allow you to do is make a mistake or two and not completely blow out. Whether it be the holster, magazines, or your gun itself, there are certain choices that will help you get closer to the blazing speed you're looking for. I'm shooting a Springfield Armory 45 Auto full house race gun that was customized by Tim Dillon out at the Springfield Armory Custom Shop. This is a beautiful gun that has been completely reworked. You can see, first of all, it's got a tough, good-looking metal alloy finish and Kokobo wood grips from South America. To reduce recoil, it's got a Wilson Combat Compensator. It features a custom combat hammer that's been hand checkered, a lightweight aluminum speed trigger, adjustable Bomar rear sight, a checkered Wilson slide release, and a Swenson extended safety release. It's got a hand checkered magazine release button, flared magazine well, and to reduce glare, a scored back of the slide at 40 lines per inch. In addition, a brown beaver tail grip safety that rides a little bit higher than stock grip safeties so that it positions your hand close to the line of the barrel, which helps in keeping control of the muzzle during recoil. Inside, this Tim Dillon Springfield Armory 45 has a national match barrel, flared ejection port, 13-pound wolf variable spring, extensively polished feed ramp and barrel, and an extra long ejector. All these modifications make this Springfield 45 state-of-the-art in controllability and accuracy. J. Michael Plaxco is not only an excellent shooter, but a top-notch pistol smith known and respected around the country. He explains some of the modifications done to his gun. It's a 38 Super, very similar to the 45 as far as frame and mannerisms, uh, which everybody's familiar with, the old Gullet model. Uh, it's been converted to a race gun by several additions Mainly, we have a compensator that I developed in 1980. Uh, primary function for the compensator, it reduces recoil and muzzle rise. Uh -huh. Makes the gun easier to shoot and allows it to shoot it faster. What's the function? How does it actually work? It works on a combustion principle of a jet. It has a flat surface at the front of the compensator. The gases actually hit the front of the comp and pulls the gun forward and down uh -huh. so to redirect the energy. Out. Right. It's kind of like a uh, jet axe, jet propeller. Right? right, right. The Ventura principle okay. in the carburetion system. And the reason most competitors are going to 38 Super because small bullet running faster produces more gas pressure and gives you more pressure to work with. Uh -huh. Okay, what other 
the modifications they've done. You got it checkered. Uh, okay, we start out, we take the frame and checker it, metal checkering, front and rear, and also on the trigger guard to allow you to hang on to the gun better. Fully adjustable sights, it's got a Bomar sight system on it that's been milled into the slide to get the sight picture lower to the weapon, make it more compact. From start to finish, including the cost of the gun, you're looking at approximately $2,000 for a full house race gun. Yeah, this is like top of the line. Right, this is our top of the line model. Um, it doesn't take near this expensive a gun to be competitive. Um, what this does, it allows you to make mistakes sometimes and get away with it. World IPSC champion Rob Latham shoots a Springfield Armory 1911 A1 style 38 Super that has had extensive work done to it. The gun started off as a 9mm. We've converted them over to 38 Super because that's the caliber that works the best for all the matches we need an automatic for. So the gun starts out as that, the basic automatic. Uh, from then on we change practically everything. You keep the basic configuration but you're going to use a, a muzzle brake with a special barrel to improve the accuracy. Uh, it's going to have adjustable sights on it so you can zero the gun perfectly, that's very important. Mm -hmm. The gun has to shoot exactly where the sights look. You have to have that perfect. You checker the gun to make the gun not slip in your hand when you are when you're sweat. Uh, you may change little things like beaver tail, grip safeties. For more support or for a, an easier draw, uh, the triggers are adjusted so that they're very light, probably two and a half, two and a quarter pounds is an average for most shooters. Um, the guns are hard chromed. The metal always is the surface that's on the, our guns because it's very durable. I mean, I've yet to see it wear through. Oh, yeah. It's very slick and it's very hard. Uh, take a a, the right, you take a metalloid gun and, you, and if you've drawn it a thousand times, you wipe it off and it looks brand new. You take a gun that's blued, you draw it ten times and now it's got polished areas on it where it's starting to go through. So it is very durable. Basically, you change the gun around so that it suits you better. It's more comfortable for you to handle. A match like this really uh, takes a lot of good gun handling you need to be very smooth with the gun you have to be able to pick up targets so the gun has to be very friendly to you you don't want any sharp edges you, if the gun is not comfortable in your hand you're gonna think about that instead of your shooting one way towards fast shooting is to minimize your reloading this can be done with shooting star magazines for both 45 auto and 38 super each holds one extra round than the standard issue magazines with no problems feeding or jamming most, if not all, of the top shooters use magazines from Shooting Star Industries, a company formed by Chip McCormick. I build magazines, which are the same length as the old standard magazine, yet they hold one extra cartridge, which is very important in IPSC shooting because the rule states that you can't have a magazine that extends beyond the gun. Of course, uh, I do have the extra round, so that means if you have... That means if you have what we call brain fade and you start to miss a plate or two here or there, you've got an extra cartridge and it may save you a reload. You know, when you travel all this way and spend so much money to get here and to practice, it's kind of nice to take three-tenths of a second to trigger again versus two seconds to reload. Now that you've got your gun and magazines in shape, we should talk about ammunition. The rule of thumb is that the lighter the load, the less recoil, and conversely, the quicker you should be able to acquire your next sight picture to squeeze off your next shot. Of course, in certain competitions, power factors must be maintained, and in street situations, I would prefer to have the most powerful load possible. Regardless of the ammunition, you've got to have a firm wraparound grip with 60 or 65% of the hold or grip with your left hand and the remainder with your right. You've got to almost relax your right hand so that your trigger finger remains flexible. All of the top shooters have a big, strong grip with a dominant wraparound left hand. Many shooters like Rob Latham and Brian Enos over-exaggerate their left hand, completely engulfing the right hand. Even combat master Mickey Fowler demonstrates a strong left-handed grip, shown here going all out with a Ruger Blackhawk firing Federal Factory 240 grain 44 Magnum ammunition. Now how's that for control? Six hits on an eight inch plate at 10 yards in two seconds flat. I hope I've been able to demonstrate to you how important a strong left-handed grip is, even if it's over-exaggerated for shooting from shot to shot. One of the fastest, if not the fastest shooters in the world shot to shot is Rob Latham. Robbie was born with a natural ability of great hand-eye coordination. Notice how tall or straight up he stands. It's almost as if he's looking right over the sight. Pay attention to a strong grip with the left hand wrapped around his shooting hand. Again, the left hand actually grips the pistol tighter than the right hand, 
which of course helps in controlling recoil, but it also allows the trigger finger to be flexible. Latham shoots in the isosceles stance, which I believe is faster than the weaver stance. Okay, so you've got a full house race gun, an eight round shooting star magazine, light but powerful ammunition, and the final ingredient, a holster that holds the gun securely, but also allows for a quick draw without binding or tugging at your gun. Now my choice is the final option holster from Safariland. This holster was developed by Bill Rogers, one of the finest creative minds in the firearms holster and accessories industries. It uses a trigger block. It's a molded, injection molded part that mounts inside the holster that locks on the trigger card. And uh, really I, I designed it, drew it out uh, on the way home from a match uh, from the Nationals. And uh, simply because I, I needed something that would work, would stabilize the weapon in the holster. Like if you notice these holsters are cut down way low and to be able to stabilize the gun so they don't rock forward. The only way we could do it is really a, using a block that attaches to the trigger guard. It unlocks when you draw up, but it doesn't unlock going forward. So it gives you a very quick, effortless draw, but it stabilizes the weapon from rocking in the holster. So kind of a stroke of genius there. Uh. Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's a stroke of genius, but it is, it is novel. No one has ever done it. It has worked real well for us. The holster is called the final option. And uh, we have sold quite a few of them recently. It's, uh, we just came out with it, so it's one of those products that's done real well for us right off the start. Of course, many of the top shooters use Ernie Hill leather, Bianchi, Davis, and several other makes of holster. The main criteria is that it provides trouble-free draw and that you like it. Now we're ready to shoot. And of course, the one area that must be examined very closely is the draw. In fact, the draw and first shot are what I consider to be the most important facets of how to shoot fast. Let's compare the draws of some of the fastest shooters in the world. The first shooter we're going to look at is Robbie Latham. Latham is six foot one, around 210 pounds. He's a big guy, but he's got a lot of finesse. Notice the way he scoops the pistol out of his holster. There's a minimum of movement. His head is perfectly still, and besides for his arms and shoulders, he's like a rock. You'll see that he fires as soon as his arms are fully extended. He doesn't waste any time looking for a sight picture. Look at his big, strong grip, especially with that left hand. On the draw, his left hand comes down and rests on his lower chest, waiting for the right hand to catch up and get the gun out of the holster. Latham's fastest time for the draw and first shot is 0.85 seconds. Now here it is again in real time. Our next shooter is Ken Tapp. I mentioned earlier that Ken Tapp is 56 years old. But don't let that fool you. This man is fast. Although he doesn't look it, he stands at least six foot two inches tall. Ken is from the leather slap days, and you can see it in his draw. He's a lot more physical than Latham, and he does drop his head to meet his gun. Tap also displays a big, strong grip, and his left hand is also wrapped completely around his right. On the draw, his left hand doesn't come close to his body, but meets his right hand in midair on its way to his sight picture. His eyes seem to be the one body part that isn't moving. Tap thrusts the gun into a sight picture and fires without having his arms fully extended, maybe to keep the sight closer to those 56-year-old eyes. Whatever it is, it works. Ken Tap's fastest time, 0.84 seconds. Now again, in real time. Chip McCormick may not have the fastest draw, but he may have the most consistent. He's all concentration when he's on the line. On the draw, he comes down hard on the gun, as evidenced by the movement in his holster. Though he may give up valuable microseconds there, McCormick is very efficient at meeting the pistol with his left hand, and he fires as soon as his arms are fully extended. He also employs a strong wraparound left-handed grip, though he does appear to have some trouble getting comfortable with his left hand. It may be the left index finger trying to get around the trigger guard. McCormick's head doesn't move, but his body does shift 
as he brings the pistol into his sight area. Chip's fastest time is 0.93 seconds. Our next shooter is J. Michael Plaxco, who came up with a holster modification that raised the gun about four inches higher to his hand. Plaxco is a tall guy, about six foot three inches, so this helps shorten the distance his right hand has to travel to get to the gun. He also has a very efficient way of connecting his left hand with his right. You'll notice very little head movement and his rather unique way of thrusting the gun to the extremely extended position and squeezing the trigger instantly. You'll see here that he misses that first shot because he doesn't really stop on the target. Plaxco has big hands and totally wraps the left hand around the right. Plaxco's fastest time from the draw to the first shot is 0.92 seconds. Here it is in real time. Now here's Brian Enos, who shares shooting style with Rob Latham, because of course, they developed their skills as shooting partners in Mesa, Arizona. Brian is a tall and lean guy, probably about six foot two, 190 pounds. He's got incredibly strong hands and forearms, most likely developed because he's an auto mechanic and works with his hands on a daily basis. Take note of his right hand in the surrender position, slightly curved, ready to accept his pistol from the holster. He reaches for his pistol more aggressively than Latham and has no trouble meeting his right hand with his left. Enos has large hands and you can see the total left hand wrap around grip. His eyes barely move an inch as he thrusts the pistol into his line of sight and fires immediately once his hands are fully extended in the isosceles position. Enos recorded the fastest time of the day at 0.82 seconds, shown here again in real time. Jerry Barnhart is our next shooter, and if you follow the competition shooting circuit, you know this guy is fast and wound up more than anyone at the match. On the line, he's all concentration, takes lots of practice time with and without the pistol probably to get that muscle memory going. Notice how he thrusts the pistol out towards the target instead of up. Jerry stands about five foot seven and must weigh about 140 pounds. He's quick with his hands and just looks like he should be fast. On the draw, his left hand comes down with his right hand, touches his body and waits to meet his right hand on the way towards the target. He also sports a strong left-handed grip, fully wrapped around the trigger guard and over his right hand. He, of course, shoots in the isosceles position and hesitates on the target just long enough to squeeze the trigger. Once he's fully extended, he knows exactly where his sight is and where that round will go. Jerry also displays good follow through, making sure the bullet hits his mark. His fastest time at the draw was 0.89 seconds, shown now in real time. The two fastest draws will be compared here in slow motion between two different camera angles. Here's Brian Enos with a 0.82 second first shot and Ken Tapp at 0.84 seconds. Of course, no matter how fast you are in this type of competition shooting, a good fast draw shooter will beat you every time. Here's Bob Munden, first in a method called thumbing at 0.45 seconds. And now, fanning at 0.13 seconds. Remember, this is with live ammunition. Please do not try this at home. Each one of our featured shooters is a great talent in their own right. Each are different in physical build and shooting styles, but each share several techniques or similarities, if you will, that have helped put them at the top of the competition shooting world. I talk with them one-on-one -on -one about how to shoot fast. I go and I shoot and practice like I would in a match. I, I started shooting all my matches cold, like for the steel challenge. 
I'll practice the thing, I'll shoot the five runs, and I'll shoot it cold. I won't warm up at all, other than doing my stretching and things like that that I feel is important um, to maintain yourself and be loose. But mostly it's a mental attitude, and, and I did a lot of analyzing my techniques and, and things, and I, I asked a lot of people that used to watch me shoot, hey, give me some suggestive criticism here, you know? I want to I wanna improve this, and I feel that I can, but sometimes you, you kind of feel like you're in a, in a hole, and you can't dig yourself out. You get to a plateau, and for me, I, I like to keep advancing, and I, I feel that you know, I, the... Mentally, if you know what you want, there is no limit. And I don't set a limit on what I can, you know, what I'm doing. And I feel that I'll be able to keep increasing. At home, do you uh, do a lot of dry drawing or dry firing? Do you, do you draw from the mirror like Rob, Rob and Latham say that, you know, uh, uh, they do that? Uh, what Bef do you do at home? Before a match, I do. Uh, my work has taken me away from a lot of my practice this year as I'm an electrician. And... Uh, but when I do have time and before the matches, uh, if I feel like I'm a little bit tight or I'm not real sure, I need to just boost my confidence, I'll, I'll dry fire and draw it home. But most of it I do at the range. My shooting at the range is I simulate. I try to simulate the match pressure. The There really isn't any pressure. You take the pressure to the match. How do you go to the next shot and how do you do it fast? Well, like I said, you want to be loose. You you want to draw the gun. You want to be real loose. You want to be quick on your first shot, but you have to learn to, as soon as you have the gun up onto the first shot and you release that shot, then you have to kind of relax and start to flow. If, if you start to shoot and you're jerky and you feel tight, you're going you're gonna to fire before you get to the target or you're going to sweep past the target. You're going to see your sight on the target, but you're going to be so tense and that you can't flow. and you're either going to shoot in front or behind the target. And I did that a lot until mm -hmm. I learned to do that. And you got to be aggressive. And I like to shoot aggressive. I don't, if, so if. You got to go for that target and lock on. Do you lock it? Do you stop and then move? Or do you, or do you are you flowing right by it? What do you think? I've, I've watched tapes of myself in the past and I don't fully stop on my targets. When I, I'm kind of looking ahead to see the target as I'm coming to it. And when I see my sight coming into the target, I'm getting ready to touch the shot, and when I see the sh when I see my sight right on the target, I shoot. I don't think I necessarily stop. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a split second type mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. I was shooting a Colt, and uh, Springfield Armory approached me um, this spring and uh, asked me if I'd shoot their gun and so forth. And uh, they sent me a pistol up, and we built um, his design on Springfield's gun. And Springfield has a real good gun. Um, I think they're going to be real competitive. They are competitive with their, their workmanship and for the price is very, very, uh, it's good. I like it. I have a friend in Pennsylvania, his name's Kim Yakich, and uh, he makes a 173 grain. And it's a lead bullet. Uh, it's a little bit different than the H and G design. It's a little bit heavier in the front and has a little bit less bearing service, but it's very accurate. I use that at the Bianchi Cup this year in Steel Challenge. And, I try to, I want to use as light a bullet as I can, and I was using, I think, 4.9 of bullseye. I wanted to obtain a 800 foot per second bullet. I look at the target, um, I'm listening for the split second that I hear that buzzer, not the full tone, just, just the start of the beat, and I'm going for my weapon. I'm trying to, I don't necessarily get a good grip on a gun when I first put my hand on it it's usually as I'm bringing it up I'm adjusting my grip um, I believe in trying to get the weapon out as fast as you can and get that first shot off and then start going with it um, but I usually try to bring the weapon up into my field of view and I'm looking for that front sight I'm looking for the, the black on white as it would be here the black front sight on the white background of the target well, the, the things that are important for me is uh, I just grip the pistol comfortably with the right hand, and I after I flip the safety off on the draw, well, I just leave my right thumb up like that, and I just work the, the left hand into where the heel of my hand can get right in on the grip there and, and actually kind of hold the gun forward so it's actually camming the muzzle down with this hand. And it's, 
it's probably using about 60% of the gripping force and the right hand's using about 40%. So that my right hand can use a firm but you know, but somewhat relaxed grip. My left hand can, can be used to hold the gun down and that way my, my right finger can work the trigger at its, you know, its fastest possible speed. In this type of grip, you clamp down with your right thumb a little bit on your left hand, it just, it just locks the gun in your hand real securely. I think if you, like if uh, Rob uses a real similar grip, if you watch uh, our guns in recoil, while well, you can, you can, it's real evident that that grip works. I see you spray the black stuff on the front grip and why do you do that? On the, yeah, on the sight and the rear sight, just to give the sights as much definition as possible. That's the critical thing, you know, that when you're shooting, the, the most critical factor is that the sights are so real black. definition, right, Quite just black. black. Just because it's a real, mainly, it's a non-glare black. Uh -huh. You know, it's a real, uh, real non-glare finish. And that's the thing you're looking for, is just to get all the light because the sunlight can affect the way the sights align. It can, it can trick you into holding them to the left or to the right or high or low and the way the sun hits that front sight. So you don't want any of that affecting your, your now, sight picture. So what's the difference, say, shooting a shotgun fast as opposed to, you know, shooting a pistol? Is it basically the same stuff? Or yeah, it's real similar because uh, it's pretty... The, the important thing is that you hesitate on each target, whether it be a pistol or a shotgun. There's hardly... Very seldom will there be targets that you don't have to hesitate on. They're that easy to hit. And so... As long as you just hesitate on each target, well, that gives your body time to take care of all the alignment for you. You know, you just have to shoot at your own speed and and uh, just keep your head relaxed, yeah. Just keep relaxed and shoot at your own speed. Well, I've been uh, shooting since I was just a kid at something and uh, tin cans or targets. Uh, I've shot black powder, high power, uh, NRA high power, uh, action shooting and hipsic shooting. And, just about anything that you can pull the trigger at. What do you like most? What's your favorite style of shooting? I like the, the steel steel shooting, like steel challenge. Why so? Uh, it's fast. Uh, it's a good. The spectators can relate to it. They know what's going on, and it uh, gets the old adrenaline going. You have one of the fastest draws we've seen, and and you know it's really neat because you go down and you just slap the leather and just yank it right out. How do you develop something like that? Well, when I was a kid, uh, 16, 17 years old, I practiced. Uh, Ed McGivern was my idol. I practiced quite a bit then. I guess it uh, carried through. I'm not nearly as fast as I used to be, but uh, I just do the best I can. What kind of gun are you shooting this year? And uh, leather and ammo. Give me a full rundown of your equipment. Okay, my gun is a Springfield Armory. It's uh, done by Paul Rice at Huntington, West Virginia. has a Plaxico comp on it. And I'm shooting a 160 grain bullet, three and a half grains of bullseye in Ernie Hill leather. Well, I keep my eye on the, the target, right? Uh, and when I draw, I try to pick the gun up uh, in my peripheral uh, vision as soon as possible. And then and I make an alignment of the sights. And uh, as soon as it's in place, I uh, try to squeeze the trigger, but it's more of a jerk than it is anything. Now, how about going from shot to shot? Not, not necessarily that, you know, you get that first shot. Are you really indexing the sight every time? Uh, if I'm doing things correctly, I'm indexing. If, uh, if I'm just hosing, why, well, I'm a little panicky. If you were telling uh, a young novice shooter out there how to, how to really get fast, what would, you, what would you say to him? Well, you, you've got to do a lot of dry firing. And uh, if you do that correctly, you can avoid a lot of the expenditure of ammunition. And uh, it just takes a lot of time. You've got uh, certain reflexes. Each individual has certain speed. He can react so fast to the buzzer. And uh, I've always had fast reflexes. And even though they're slower than they once were, they're, you know, I, I just try to uh, train myself and keep, on, uh, keep uh, up at uh, my maximum level. How do you practice at home? What kind of uh, drills do you put yourself through and how many rounds do you shoot on a weekly basis? I shoot quite a bit. I shoot for recreation and I don't uh, really shoot any particular drill or anything like that. I just, whatever I shoot at, I just try to hit it and do it as fast as I can. To shoot fast, you have to, to practice a frame of mind. If you find the right frame of mind, which is smooth and controlled, you'll go much faster than if you're pushing. When I was a novice at shooting, and I, and I used to feel like I really had to push to shoot with the rest of these guys, I, I felt my muscles get tight. I got tense. It puts a lot more pressure on you before you get 
to the match, even flying out here on the airplane. When you know you're going out there to push, the pressure is twice. When you know you're coming out to be smooth and relaxed and your accuracy is going to be 100%, it takes so much pressure off of you. And you're so much smoother and relaxed that it puts you in the frame of mind to be fast. You just kind of, Some days you're faster and some days you're slower, but if you're in the proper frame of mind, you will be fast. And for the newcomer, that's what they have to practice is, is mental conditioning as much as their shooting technique. In the matches, you seldom get a chance to shoot enough to get warmed up. So that's the reason I just shoot for scores is basically what counts is how well you shoot cold. And uh, so I feel like it's more important to just shoot, the, as we do here, five runs with a throwaway and stop and analyze that, sit out for five, ten minutes, and then maybe come back and shoot it again. I feel like a lot of the shooters I know that could do better, they sit there until they're ankle deep in brass, and then they try and come out and shoot the same speed they were able to do when they were warmed up. And they forget that they have to come out here and do it cold. So I think that's the key to the practice is go out to the range and find out what you can do when you're cold, not when you're warmed up. Most of the good shooters, their most common practice when they're not practicing for a particular match is to draw and fire one shot because from the start position, if you can get a good grip on the gun and then bring the gun into a perfect shooting position time and time again, well, sweeping several plates is Mickey Mouse after you get that, that first lock in on that first plate. So yeah, the draw is probably the toughest move. As the gun comes up into the shooting position, I start to acquire my focus on the sight actually before I lock into my shooting position. Oh, really? Yes, and I feel like that's been a big help to me in, in speeding up my draw. I know a lot of the other shooters throw the gun out there, then identify the sights, and then position the sights on the target. I'm trying to focus on the sights and position them on the target before I lock in so that as it's coming up. Well, and actually when I draw, I bring the gun up in front of my face a little sooner and then stab at the target so I have that length to, to get the sight on the target and focus on it. The key here is, is you don't want your head to move. If your head's moving, your eyes are moving, the gun's moving, you've got three different objects moving that you're trying to coordinate on that first shot. So in my opinion, you want the eyes and the head as still as you can when the draw so that the only moving object is the gun. Oh, dry firing is, is the biggest part of everybody's practice, or it should be. And dry draw, I guess. And dry draw, because ammo is expensive. Yeah, it takes just a good general basic um, fitness program. Um, I started back approximately two months ago swimming, trying to get back in shape. Um, doesn't require rigorous weight training, but most of folks do something to maintain general overall body fitness. And uh, the mental game is something you work on all the time. Anytime you got a spare moment, you're driving a car, or you go to bed at night for a few minutes, you kind of think about what you want to do and just kind of anticipate the circumstances that can come up in a tournament and try to prepare for them. We did a little bit different this year. I went home and tried to figure out some ways to save some time, so um, I moved my holster up approximately four inches on the belt to cut down the travel time from the surrender position down to the gun. Um, seemed to help quite a bit. We've got good feedback from the, uh, some of the other competitors as well, information on it today. It's the Ernie Hill holster that I modified. As far as a weapon, I'm using a Springfield Armory uh, 38 Super that we manufactured myself. And when I'm coming up, bringing the gun up, I want to bring the gun up high in the line of sight and push the gun straight to the target. Uh -huh. You don't want to over the top or under the bottom. It should be come up like a punch straight to the target. So come out over. and go out and punch to the target, and the gun should stop. And for a millisecond, you should see a perfect sight picture on the target. Uh -huh. That's one of the toughest things to learn in practical shooting is learn what is an acceptable sight picture for the shot required. And you must have the mental ability to shoot at your own cadence, letting your sights dictate the cadence of fire. If your sights are not lined up, you don't break the shot until they are aligned, uh -huh. whether it's a half a second, two seconds, or a tenth of a second. I see. I see. You've got to have the mental ability to change gears and let the sights dictate when you break the shot. When we're shooting these reasonably close targets like we are out to 20, 25 yards, it's still a precision shot. And the technique seems to be winning now. We come up and we pause the pistol on the first target for the, the few milliseconds it takes to get an appropriate sight picture. 
And then if we're shooting right, from that point on, we can pretty much index to the target and stop the gun, each target, and the gun will align itself. Okay, because you're already locked in, huh? Right. The gun recoils, it comes back down with a sight alignment in a acceptable sight picture for the shot required. All you're doing, you're looking at the sight, but you're just verifying the sight picture. You're not having to correct it. With proper technique, the gun is shooting itself. Why do you like to shoot? Probably the mental game of it. I love to compete. Um, not necessarily from the point of having to win, but I love to compete. You know, I want if we want to throw rocks or shoot a rifle or shotgun or pistol, whatever. You know, you name the game and we'll play it. If the holster moves, it wasn't a good draw. If you're watching you know, a draw, the gun should come out and basically should close around. If this is the butt of the gun, should close around it and pop the gun out. You don't waste any time. You're not accomplishing a thing hitting the gun. All you need is the gun to go from in the holster to in your hand and you make that uh, transition as smooth and consistently as, as, as possible. And my draw pretty much does that. I, that's what I try to base everything around, is being smooth and calm when I shoot. No real jerky mo movements. You know, let the, uh, eliminate all the delays. That's how you go fast. Right. Not by moving quickly, it's by doing less. I'm a lazy shooter. <laughs> Smart shooter. Now, <laughs> I've noticed uh, uh, here watching the tapes this year, and, and Kenny and I were talking about, a lot of guys are starting to cup their hand and like they'll get the form of the gun they'll come up and they'll keep it right there right. Castlow's doing that you're doing that a little bit uh, why so I mean is, does that yeah basically what you're doing is you're getting yourself as ready as possible before you shoot to shoot what, what I mean by that is is as opposed to putting your hand in an open position you're gonna have to put it in this position right so even things as small as getting your fingers in the position they're going to be on the gun. Get that done before. See, that's not, they're not, that way you don't have to take time once the whistle goes off to do any of that kind of work. Get everything done you can before instead of, you know, after the whistle blows. It's just... Just by closing around. Takes you less. betcha it takes less time. As simple as possible. That's what you're trying to do. You say you're, uh, you're good at target acquisition going back and forth. Why so? What do you try to do there? Are you looking for the front sight or do you... I, do you I have good eyesight, one, but I have the ability, I change focus very easily. It's, I look at targets well, but I can see the sights. I move very smooth, and it's that fluid motion that makes you fast. So, you know, plaques go with more of a turn. Uh, right, you know, you're, right. You don't really no, just kind of motion. No, most of it happens in your knees. Uh -huh. You watch me shoot, like, some of the stages where it's bigger. You do a lot of the turning in your knees, and, uh. and it's, that's a much more effective way than turning at the waist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you just kind of just bounce through it. Even Sweet. like in the outer limits, uh, you look at uh, McCormick and he comes over and he, he's like a board, his upper body, just kind of right. no movement on his lower torso. That works real good there because the shots are so much more difficult. Because of right, because of the, the, the precision you need in the shot. But on the other stages, that's not the very best way. But you can get by. That's the whole thing about this game. Everybody does it a little bit differently. Uh, and you can get it done. You can get it done. That's what really matters. Well, the gun is a Springfield Armory 1911 and it's caliber 38 Super. Pretty much the same. It's becoming normal. It's been modified by Wilson. It's got an AccuComp LEK kit, the bushing type kit. Uh, you know, basically, that's all the trick work. Uh, it's gotten a metalloy finish, so it'll last forever. Uh, extremely accurate, extremely reliable. Uh, and it's the best setup going, period. Well, the 38 Super Ammo is a little tricky, uh, yeah, but yeah. not necessarily for this event because you don't have a major power, right? Exactly. We're shooting such light loads here, you can shoot anything. And the 38 Super has quite a bit less recoil than 45 because we can load them down to even lighter power levels and still keep the bullet velocity up. So I can shoot a light bullet going fast as opposed to a slow, uh, with 45 to go slow or to, to have low recoil, you have to slow the bullet down to a point that on the long shots, it's put dunk. Whereas with the, with the supers, we can shoot light bullets, get the, keep the velocity up, and get quick target you know, response, and still have light recoil. So it's really a better gun here than anywhere else. How important is that quick target response so you can go on to the next shot, I guess? Right? For the people who are really on, and the top level shooters, it matters a lot. Because not so much from a response of when you hit, but that on the occasions when you miss, you don't want to go put, bung, and go on and shoot another shot before you even found out you missed that one. You want to know immediately. You need to know now if you missed or if you hit. Draw. I do a lot of dry firing and a lot of drawing in the home, you know, stuff like that. I, it, you need to be very familiar with the gun. You can't pick up the gun and say it doesn't feel right. All that stuff has got to be di um, dialed in, should we say. So you, I play with the guns a lot. You know, I handle the guns a lot. I, I, uh, you have them with you all a lot of times? Uh, not, not so much that as I do when I'm at the house. Uh -huh. I usually have the safe open and a few guns are out and I'm dry firing. I play with the guns a lot. I'm very familiar with them. I don't pick them up and say this doesn't feel right. right. I don't ever have that problem. 
uh, as far as practice on the range goes, I'm always working on whatever the stage is that I'm about to shoot. For instance, you know, we're getting ready to shoot Bianchi, we're shooting those events. We're getting ready for the Steel Challenge. I mean, we're talking the week before I'm shooting Steel Challenge events. Now this match is over, we're going to immediately pick up our IPSC guns, load some heavy loads, and start working on that. You don't, work, you don't keep, you know, you don't do a little of everything all the time. You specialize as much as you can. You know, I won't, ha I won't be using uh, our, my revolver again for another year until this event comes up next year. Uh, you're getting a, a squeezing motion here. You're not really grabbing the gun so much as this as you're pinching into it. Okay, but you're not pinching hard enough that you feel any tension because you want your trigger finger to be able to work uh, all by itself. Your left hand goes on to the gun and pretend like it's hinged here and pinches into the gun and you get a real solid with your left hand si inside side to side motion and your left thumb just points forward towards the target. And that's pretty much the grip right there. The keys, if there are such things as just keys, are simply to be relaxed. Very important. If you're tense, your muscles do not work well when they're tense. Uh -huh. You need to be as relaxed as possible to move quickly and fluidly. Uh, you don't have to go that fast to shoot fast. You can't go faster than you're capable of going, for instance. Keep yourself under control. You still have to hit the targets, regardless how fast or slow you go. Uh, economy of movement is, is extremely important. You don't want to make any motion you don't have to. You don't want to do anything extra. So you take whatever it takes to do. You use as, as quick and, and short a motion on the draw as you can. You, you stay on the target as short a time as possible. You want to hesitate long enough for the gun to go off and go to the other target. Very important. Where are you seeing the sight picture when you're coming up? I want to see the first. I'll be looking at the target. As I bring the gun up, I'll pick it up in my peripheral vision at about this level. And you jam it straight out? And push it straight into the target. And as it's going into the target, that's where you're picking up your sight. So as soon as your arm goes out, you shoot. Uh -huh. There's no bang. It's boom, like yeah. that. Right. So you're straight forward up both arms. Yeah, all, both arms stick straight out. And I'm very relaxed. I'm not using muscle tension to do that. Keep your arms straight and relaxed. I see. Very important. Okay. Shooting fast, there's a lot more to it than just pulling your pistol out of your holster and blasting. Each one of the shooters on this tape have displayed their incredible speed and accuracy. And I feel that each has something in common, a characteristic that I believe separates the master blaster speed demons from the shooters who are just fast. I call it the sweet spot theory. Keep in mind that a tennis racket has a sweet spot, a golf club has a sweet spot, and a baseball bat has a sweet spot as well. And everybody knows about those. Well, I believe that a shooter's eye or aim has a sweet spot. Imagine, if you will, a spot that is in front of you that is the exact spot where your front sight rests when you're in your normal shooting position. The sweet spot. Through thousands of hours of practice and repetition, these expert shooters have trained their eyes and muscle memory to know where to bring the pistol without looking at it and when it is in the proper shooting position. Therefore, all they've got to do is concentrate on the object that they wish to engage, never taking their eyes off of it, and bring the front sight into their field of view, instantly squeezing the trigger. It sounds simple, and in theory it is. The top shooters never move their head and never take their eyes off of their target, always allowing the front sight of their pistol to come into their field of view. Their eyes don't move, the pistol moves into their field of view. Remember what Robbie Latham said, as soon as your arms go out, shoot. And as it's going into the target, that's where you're picking up your sight. So as soon as your arm goes out, you shoot. Uh -huh. Chip McCormick said it too. And the key here is, is you don't want your head to move. If your head's moving, your eyes are moving, the gun's moving, you've got three different objects moving that you're trying to coordinate on that first shot. So in my opinion, you want the eyes and the head as still as you can when the draw, so that the only moving object is the gun. It even works with rifles and shotguns. Here's John Shaw, combat master and firearms instructor. I'll people when I mount the gun to the shoulder, they do something like this. Bring the gun up and drop the head to it. Bad wrong too. Get that natural point of aim right where it's supposed to be and leave that head right where it is. I got my bead lined up on the target. All I got to do is come up and hit my jaw and bring it right into my shoulder. No movement there at all. By keeping your head still and bringing the weapon to your line of sight, you save time by not having to look for that front sight. You know when the gun is in position. Your aim is true. No second guessing because your muscles feel your position. 
Now with all that in mind, how do you obtain that blazing speed? Well, of course, you must practice your draw and practice your draw some more, whether it be from competition holster or concealment. And remember that to be truly fast, you must learn to bring the pistol up into your sweet spot. Don't drop your head looking for your front sight and don't move your eyes away from your target. Develop the confidence to know that once your pistol's there, your sight is there, and then you can squeeze off the round. And then there's your sweet spot. You must develop the confidence that once your pistol is in this sweet spot, you automatically know that your sights are exactly where your eyes are looking. It takes practice and getting used to bringing the gun into your sight picture, but I know it'll help you be a faster, more accurate shooter. You can practice at home. Remember, use an unloaded gun and concentrate on bringing the gun into your field of view. It helps if you thrust the gun onto your target rather than swinging it up into your field of view simply because there will tend to be less sway on the weapon. Practice makes perfect. I'm Lenny McGill. Thanks for watching How to Shoot Fast and Accurately. Please stay tuned for previews of more firearms videos from Mail Order Video. Till next time, remember to always check the action of your firearm when you first pick it up. Safe shooting. Thanks for watching. Welcome to rock and roll number one, fully automatic machine gun fun. In this program, we'll look at automatic weapons from around the world, including the Beretta P-12S from Italy, the Colt M-16 from the United States, from Israel, the Uzi 9mm, the Russian AK-47, the Ingram Mac-10, it's all here, plus lots more, so sit back and get ready to rock and roll. Shooter, stand by! Ready! What's it like to be known as the fastest, most accurate pistol shooter alive? Only one man knows for sure. Rob Latham of Mesa, Arizona. Today, he's putting that reputation on the line because as this exciting four-stage pistol competition unfolds, he'll be challenged by more than 200 of the best pistol shooters in the world, all competing for $150,000 in cash and prizes. 
as the 1985 National Rifle Association's Bianchi Cup gets underway. Five events, it's all on steel targets. Each course is different from the next. Every shooter shoots a total of five courses of fire, or five stages, and they throw out their worst event. Again, we're trying to promote speed. We want to get that let it all hang out type of an atmosphere. And uh, this way, if you have a disaster run, uh, a gun malfunction, or the shooter just simply doesn't do well one time, that's out of his hair and he can keep on pushing for a better score. That's Mike Fitchman, who along with Mike Dalton developed the course of fire you're about to see. Described in two words, it's speed and steel. Because today, more than 250 of the world's fastest and most accurate pistol shooters compete against the clock and themselves as the 1984 Steel Challenge World Speed Shooting Championship gets underway. Soldier of Fortune magazine presents the 1984 Soldier of Fortune convention. In this videotape, we'll take you rappelling down the side of a 14-story building, racing through the desert on the Warrior fast attack vehicle. And here's something new and different this year, pugil stick competitions. Plus, you'll see all phases of the Soldier of Fortune three-gun combat match with pistol, rifle, and shotgun. The latest weapons demonstrated by the manufacturers themselves. New products at the Military Arms and Collectors Show. Speakers including Soldier of Fortune magazine publisher Robert K. Brown, Major General J.K. Singlob, and Afghan freedom fighter Hassan Galandi. And of course, more of what's made the Soldier of Fortune convention what it is today. The sport of combat shooting is not new. While the Southwest Pistol League is generally credited with starting the competition aspect of combat shooting, the roots stretch back to the training of Union soldiers during the Civil War. The military has been utilizing combat methods since the introduction of the 1855 rifle musket, the first military rifle with precision sights. Military training consisted of both rifle and handgun practice. And although law enforcement agencies, such as the FBI, have been using the shotgun in training and on duty, combat shotgun competitions have only been introduced in the last decade. The popularity of such events, such as the Steel Challenge, which has its own separate shotgun match, has brought the shotgun into mainstream combat shooting. One of the consistent top contenders in the shooting sports is John Shaw. Shaw has won more major tournaments and finished consistently higher than any other combat shooter in the world. His victories include the 1980 and 1981 IPSC National Championships, gold medals in the International IPSC Championships, and five consecutive Soldier of Fortune Shotgun Championships. His speed and accuracy have earned him the title of the fastest shotgun in the world. When not competing and not practicing, he also teaches combat shooting to law enforcement personnel, military personnel, and civilians at his own Mid-South Institute 
of self-defense shooting, Miss, which he founded in 1982. He has also written two books on shooting, Shoot to Win and You Can't Miss. John Shaw recently conducted a shotgun seminar at the 1986 Steel Challenge. Here are the highlights of that seminar. The interest in practical shooting has grown dramatically over the past several years. Names such as Rob Latham, Brian Enos, John Shaw, and many more have become known worldwide in the households of many shooters. Hello, I'm Lenny McGill. Over the past several years, I've been producing videotapes for the shooting industry. In particular, the firearms-related pistol competitions known as the Steel Challenge and the Bianchi Cup. Now, at these tournaments, I've had the opportunity to interview some of the best pistol shooters in the world. We talked about their techniques, their stance, their trigger pull, their practice methods, even the type of guns they use. This tape is a compilation of those interviews. It's called Pistol Masters. So whether you're a beginning shooter or an accomplished shooter and been shooting for a while, I'm sure that you're going to be able to learn something from the best pistol shooters in the world. So without any further delay, let's get started in what I like to call Pistol Masters.